My name is Steve Antonuccio. I'm with the Pikes Peak Library District. And it is May 12, 2004, and I'm with uh, retired Master Sergeant John Lamerson, U.S. Army. Is that correct title That's correct. that you'd like? Okay. And uh, we're here to talk about his life, his experiences in Vietnam, and the book he wrote, The Phantom of Ben Het. And let's, let's go ahead and start uh, with the beginning, John. Tell me a little bit about your background, where you're from, where you were born, and, and uh, where you grew up. Certainly. I was born on uh, November 24, 1931 in Mansalona, Michigan, which is in Antrim County. Antrim County, Michigan is about 30 or so miles inland from Traverse City, which is on Lake Michigan. So come in about 30, 40 miles there and straight in and you, you'll be in the Massalona area. That was a, at the height of the, of, the, of, the, of the Big Depression when I was born. So times were pretty rough up there. And the little town of Massalona had a, a steel uh, a pig iron furnace and a sawmill which supported it because they used a lot of a lot of wood in the production of pig iron, and uh, they all, the company that owned that also owned the farm, a big farm. So it was sort of like a, a commune because the, they had a company store like the old Tennessee Ernie Ford's company store. You old you sold the company store because they paid their workers in scrip kind of money instead of greenbacks. You had to use the they store. They gave them a few, a few yeah. greenbacks, but but they had to use their, their money. They had to be redeemed at the store. So times were pretty rough. On my on my family at that time. Was it your father who worked there for them, or? Yeah, he worked at the he he worked in the sawmill, and I had other relatives that worked in the blast furnace, the iron furnace, and and then I had an uncle that that run the basically run the big farm where they had about 50 teams of horses that they used to skid the logs and so forth. So anyway, that's that's enough of Massalona, okay? But it was kind of country life. You yeah. grow up, uh, yeah, do they, hunting and uh, a lot of outdoor stuff. Yeah, they, yeah. It was, back then, uh, people didn't worry about kids. You know, they, uh -huh. they they could pretty much roam free, uh -huh. and you know, they didn't have many problems like, like they got now. It's, it's, it's worrying about somebody grabbing your kids. Do you have any brothers and sisters? Or I had. I'm one of uh, six. Uh -huh. The only one left is my youngest brother Jerry, who I mentioned in my book. He was in Vietnam at the same time I was, and I got to go up to Da Nang where he was stationed and visit him one time in Vietnam. How long were you in uh, Michigan? When did you finally leave? Or? Well, uh, we we moved to Indiana in the in the late 30s, about somewhere around 35, and I came back to Michigan. Well, probably probably 37 when we, around 37 when we left and we went to Indiana. My dad got work at Studebaker Auto in South Bend, Indiana. Mm -hmm. So we lived in the town of Mishawaka, and uh, and he. Had, we we went back to Michigan in in uh, 1940, and so and he went back up there to, and was working. He bought a truck and was, went into the to the uh, they had what they call cordwood that that they use in manufacturing paper and so forth. So that's what he was into back then. When I went in the Air Force in in, in June of 50, I mean uh, August of 1950. They issued me the olive drab uniform to the army. They were still wearing the old same uniform in the army. But that was before I even got out of basic training, they switched over to the dress blues. So I got issued blues along with my ODs. So I had two sets of uniforms, ODs, which we were allowed to wear for two or three years. So I had them plus my blues. Mm -hmm. So, And when, the first time I went home right after, after the training, somebody mistook me for a bus driver or, you know, <laughs> One guy, the guy that mistook me, asked me how I liked it in the net flying for the Navy. He thought I was a Navy pilot or something, because <laughs> the uniform, you know, they couldn't tell what uniform was so new. But anyway, enough said about that. Did you enjoy your time in the Air Force then? Yes, or? I enjoyed it. However, uh, the Air Force and, and I uh, didn't see eye to eye on, on some things because in 1953, the Air Force was undergoing some very, very hard changes. They had all these old uh, Old Air Force people that, that, that from World War II and the Korean War that well not not so much the Korean War uh, especially World War II that was tied in with uh, 
aircraft that were obsolete. A lot of stuff was obsolete. And so they needed to, to retrain a lot of people. Well, I was caught up in that because I was a small arms specialist, and they decided that, that I need to be qualified on the aircraft armament, which is a lot of difference because you have to know all the wiring harnesses on how to mount the, the different guns on the different planes, like B-29s and all that stuff, bomb racks and shackles and all that stuff. Well, I didn't know that, but they still made me take a test, and I failed by two points. Huh. So therefore, then they, did, they took my MOS away, my military occupational skill level away, and basically, I wasn't even authorized to wear the rank I had. So, oh. so that kind of turned me sour on the Air Force, so when my time was up, I just got out. So I went back to the same recruiting station where I went in the first time, because the Air Force and Army was all together. Well, they did split up, and the Air Force had moved about two blocks down. So those Army guys got to talking to me, <laughs> and I said, sign me up, because they said they promised me I'd go to Europe. But they didn't tell me it was going to take a year, but, but anyway. <laughs> so I went into the 3rd Armored Division that had just been reactivated and was slated to go to, to Germany after training, but their training lasted a year. So the first year, I trained at Fort Knox, Kentucky with the 3rd Armored Division. And incidentally, when, when I got into the, to the Army, they said, what do you want to do? And I thought, well, working, being a small arms specialist, working on those great big guns should be really, and I was singing an ordinance. They said, I said, I want big guns. They said, okay, you're in the field artillery. And that's how I chose my artillery career. It turned out to be a, a good choice, even though I didn't really have any choice in the, you know, they, they assigned me that. But artillery was a very fine, uh, it's a very fine profession, and I was good at it. And I did my job well in the artillery. And I fell in love with, with the Army so quick that I had taken a three-year hitch, and I took what they call a short discharge after about six months and took six years, so I'd have plenty of time to just finish my tour in Germany when I got over there. And, yeah. My oldest brother and his family were stationed in England. Uh -huh. He was Air Force, and I went over to visit him, and, the, and Mavis was 16-year-old babysitter. Oh, really? Huh. And I was a little bit older. You robbed the cradle then, huh? <laughs> Basically, I was almost, but we hit it off pretty good, and so we wrote to each other for a couple of years, and, and I finally asked her to marry me, and it took about two years for the Army to, the, the Army paperwork was a lot harder to, to get done the Air Force people in England could could get around the paperwork pretty good because the Air Force recognized, but the, the Army didn't recognize English law. They said that you, you, the background check, were, the, the English government would not allow uh, background checks to be given out against their citizens. So I had a heck of a time. I finally had to go through Scotland Yard and get some help from them to, to get them to do that for me because the Army would not would not process my paperwork without that. And you were stationed in Germany at yeah, the time that you got married to Mavis. How old was Mavis when you got married? She was uh, 18 and a half. You gotta have that half year, right? Well, you know, yeah, it makes it <laughs> closer, closer to 19. We got, we got married in February, uh, Valentine's Day, 59, and of course she would be 19 in July. So, what? You know. And you've been married how long now? 45 years. 45 years This more. last Valentine's Day. We'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about your marriage and kids later on in the interview. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and talk about your book and, and get into the story of, this, of the siege of Ben Het. Uh, in 2001, you published a book called The Phantom of Ben Het. Um, why did you write this book? Well, first off, I, I allowed the historians plenty of time to... to to write something on this. And then the lack of, after living with this, that which bothered me for years, the fact that the, the, what happened to us, a few handful of Americans holding, the, holding this, this uh, very isolated fire base under extreme difficulty for so long and winning a clear-cut American victory. Well, the only clear-cut American victory the large victory in the whole war as far as I'm concerned. For example, it had a lot of parallels to Diem Ben Phu by the French. It had a lot of parallels to Khe San, Khan Tien, and any, any other big battle that they had over there. And for example, I, I, as I say in my book, 
General Westmoreland and during the Battle of Docteau in 1967, when four regiments came into the Central Highlands, he deployed 16,000 troops. Some of them were South Vietnamese, but most of them was American, to handle those four regiments. A year and a half later, I was surrounded by the, the, basically the same size force with only 200 Americans and 500 Montagnard mercenaries, and they didn't even give me no, infantry, no American infantry because they said the South Vietnamese infantry would be my infantry support. So it was basically you and your fellow artillerymen that kind of kept uh, the, the siege from uh, turning into being overrun, right? Yes, which we expected to happen. Mm -hmm. Everybody expected it. So it was, a very, it was a, considered a kind of a, an enigma when, when it didn't happen. It was a kind of a mystery. Why did the North Vietnamese pull back? Well, I have all the answers to that, and that's what I do in my book, hopefully. And I, well, we can cover a little bit later, but why did they not uh, try and overrun you? I, I guess the, obviously the artillery was effective and the air raids were effective. But. Neither one uh, by themselves was effective enough uh -huh. because of the monsoon, river, monsoon weather. The aircraft couldn't give us the, all the protection that they would have normally been able to give in the good weather. And the artillery, we, we, we didn't have enough artillery to handle that, you know. Because those, when those, that enemy's dug in out in the jungle, you never see the enemy. They're an unseen. You know they're there. They're sort of like, if you sit on your on your patio, and you know there's an hills out in your yard, but you don't know. You, know, you can sit there all all you want to and look out there, and you're never going to see them. Right. But they're there, and you know they're there. Well, that that's a, our enemy was there, and they was there in force, right in close, close enough to, that they could snipe at us. And they could lob in those rocket RPG rockets like they're doing over in Iraq all the time. They could lob them right into our perimeter any time they felt like it. So they were right there. And we knew they were there in such force that any moment, you know, all they have to do is rise up and come out, and they could overrun us. Of course, we were considered a fortress, but don't forget, I, my job was, to, was security mm -hmm. of the that type of security. Now, I'm not talking about military police security. I'm talking about overall security. So, so why do you think they didn't uh, the, try and overrun you guys? Well, they, they, they had all intentions of doing uh -huh. so. Firepower mm -hmm. that, I, that I was able to bring to bear against the enemy. And I, at the right moment and the right place, I made a believer out of them before I got through. Mm -hmm. And they decided... It was too costly. And what did you estimate the, the troop strength of the NVA at the time that surrounded you? Well, uh, this is something I, I'd like to, to make sure you, you understand. Sure. The American Army, in all of our history, you, you read, if you read on the Vietnam War, General Westmoreland, when he was surrounded by four divisions up at Quezon, each NVA division was called a 10,000-man division. Infantry division, 10,000 men. Well, I just said we were the equivalent of at least maybe more than a division, so at least 10,000 of them. However, what I reveal in my book is that, that, that we also knew, pretty much was assured, that they had a second division in reserve standing by or just outside, getting ready to join the battle at the right moment. So you figure at least 20,000. And they were reinforced with an armored regiment, which, which I talk about in my book, and later on I did that additional research. And they also, they had an infantry, I mean an artillery regiment, which is not, I'm, when I'm talking about division, I'm talking about the, the regular old infantry division, the North Vietnamese infantry division, was uh, at least three regiments, three infantry regiments, plus they were, they had their artillery support and they had their organic support with them, like the more heavy mortars and everything. But I'm talk, when I talk about the, the infantry regiment, they had these Russian long-range field guns dug in Cambodia and Laos. They had our camp zeroed in with those, see. So, you, so you're, you can't really pin it down exactly how many, but there was a whole damn bunch of them. <laughs> We're a lot more than anybody wants to meet. We're studs in the Alamo, huh? <laughs> that's basically what... And that's uh, my, one of the, my contentions with the whole thing is, what if we had not of... of told the story of the Alamo, it would be a travesty, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, basically, that's what happened to us. Our story never was told. So I decided I owe it to my comrades, I owe it to myself and my family, 
that this story has to be told. Matter of fact, when I talked to Dr. Hallion, who's the Air Force historian even still, in 1997, I met him out at the Air Force Academy when they aired the uh, A&E Network premiere of the Half Honor Story. Mm -hmm. I was introduced to him and I told him I was writing this book and he said, well, let me know uh, after I get back to Washington. And so I, I sent him my, uh, my manuscript and he immediately answered me back. You've uncovered a story that must be told is what he told me. That gave me a little additional drive to finish it. The only thing, the reason it took me as long as it did in the end was I had a bad stroke. It slowed me up a lot. So once I recovered enough from that to, to press forward, and I always had a full plate of other things I do. Uh, writing isn't the only thing I do. And of course my wife's health, she's had MS now for 32 years. Uh, and so as a 24-7 health caregiver, you know, that, that alone keeps a lot of people busy enough oh, they yeah. don't want nothing else. But I, I work with a lot of veterans organizations and, and so forth. And, and maybe we'll get into it a little later, some of the stuff I do. Well, let's back up. You did volunteer to go over to Vietnam. Talk a little bit about the early days when you first went over and how, what were the circumstances of you going well, over there? Well, if, 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 you're, if you're really familiar with the history of the Vietnam War, you'll remember that in 68, it was a long, hot summer. There was a lot of bad feelings. That's when we really started having a lot of trouble with the civilian population against the war. I mean, the really strong stuff. And you had the, and I was in a Pershing missile outfit. I was exempt from Vietnam. I'd never went over there unless I asked for it because Pershing missiles was an atomic outfit, atomic missiles. And we weren't using atomic weapons in Vietnam. And so my MOS was critical in that I was a school trained missile technician. So I, however, the, the army was, was not, not really using me in that capacity, but, but when it came time to ship me out, the commander said, I don't want to lose this man. Mm -hmm. I was actually the operations sergeant for that 44th Miss Pershing Missile Battalion down in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. 1,200 man battalion, a very large outfit. And I, I was working very, very long, 18 hours a day because we had riot control so we, and we had uh, funeral details and I had to coordinate all that along doing my regular job, you know. So, so the workload was terrible. And I said, hell, I might as well be someplace where I'm doing doing what I want to do. You know. And those so guys, Vietnam looked better. <laughs> Vietnam looked better to me. You know. So to make a long story short, Ben Head was a Special Forces camp where they, what the Special Forces A team, a 12-man Special Forces team did, they trained the Mountain Yard Mercenary Forces, what we call the CIDG, Civilian Irregular Defense Force. These were just mountain tribesmen and they they train them to, to live, and they go on patrols to just keep, keep an eye on what the enemy's doing, early warning type thing. That's basically what it was, an early warning system, but by patrols, done by infantry patrol, special forces. And the, to help our special forces, they had an equal size South Vietnamese Army special forces team with them to, you know, to make sure that we did it, so everybody was understanding everything. So that's what that camp was. But because as a, along the Cambodian Laotian border, we had a long range artillery guns, the 175 eight inch heavy artillery guns, they could reach into, into hit the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So basically that's what we did. We'd marry up an artillery battery, which is a six gun. If it's a 155 or 105 artillery, those are six gun batteries. But in the heavy artillery, you only have four guns to a battery. So we had a four-gun battery at Ben Head in order to interdict the Ho Chi Minh Trail movement. That's what their, what their mission was, living with the Special Forces in this little camp. So tell me the troop strength again and the makeup in the camp and how big Ben Het was. Well, when I entered Ben Het, which Ben Het was a th three little hills. The main hill is where the Special Forces compound was. Special Forces had a tactical operations center right on the, the, the main part of the hill. And down on the other end of the hill was our B Bravo battery, 175, 8 inch. How so many Americans were there at the base then? 200 Americans. And they were all artillery? Most of them were artillery. Uh -huh. And so 500 Montagnard yeah. troops. Yeah. What did you think of the Montagnard troops? The Montagnards were very loyal because don't forget their dependents were right there with us. Their women and children were there with us. Now. 
Initially, we only had one company of those, about two, between two and three hundred. But because when the seeds got really tight, we brought in a company from Plagerang, which was another fire base down south, down by the Ayadrang Valley where the, we were soldiers it was based on. We had a battery down there. One of our batteries were down there. So, so we brought some of the mountain yard troops from that camp up to reinforce our mountain yards. So we ended up with 500 mountain yards. Those guys that came from Plagerang did not have their families with them. But the ones that right there from Ben Het that had been there made up from that area. They had their wives and children in the in the in the camp with and them. And is that traditional for Montyards to yeah. have their family with yes. them? Even in even in a combat zone. Huh? We paid them at that time we was paying the Montyards mercenaries, I think it was like forty one dollar, forty two dollar something. Very, uh -huh. very uh, per month that was their, their salary. But mm -hmm. to them that was a lot of money, see. And they're kind of known for that as yeah. uh, uh, the Mountain Yard uh, fighters, yeah. This is good. I'd like to get one thing straight. Mountain Yard mercenaries were similar to our American Indian, uh -huh. very primitive. The village chief was just like the old Indian chief, you know, in the, in the Indian villages. The Mountain Yard village chief, he was it. He was he was the authority, the law. So when I went into Ben Het, I sorted in there aboard a chopper, <clears throat> found out we were surrounded. By the time I got in there, we were pretty much assured that we were surrounded and cut off because we were supposed to go in by convoy and we couldn't. So that's why I sorted in aboard a chopper. And I got mortared even then. And that was the last time that that chopper pad on the main hill was ever used for the rest of the siege. Everything was the else was parachuted in? They, they yeah. Mortared. Yeah. yeah. So all, now, anything, any people that came in, we had a chopper pad on that north hill, which was north of the, of the main hill, but it was also a lower elevation. So the, most of the enemy forces, most of the, the heavy concentration of the enemy forces was to our south mm -hmm. and, and west, southwest. But because this other hill was a little bit lower, it was much harder for the enemy, enemy gunners to, to, to shoot in there. So it was a little bit safer. So it was safe enough that they could still get choppers in there. So all of our medevac, med medical evacuation choppers, most of our planes that came in were medevac choppers. Coming in, they could bring somebody in. Going out, you may not get out because they had a load of wounded. They didn't have room for you. you know? So if you came in there on a chopper, you may not get out. <laughs> no. Well, when I found out we were actually really surrounded, and he told me, here's what my orders was when I went in there. Set up a targeting section. That is a targeting section in artillery. You, you take all available intelligence information about the enemy and you plot them on the map where this enemy outfit is, where this regiment is, suspected loca enemy locations. And you get every, and all the enemy weapons, what I did was, you, can I use this here? That's a circle, see? Yeah. Well, my, my position right in the middle of that circle and every enemy weapon range, I drew a big circle. Well, I made myself a compass and I drew a big circle at a range of a 60 millimeter mortar from me, the range of a 182 millimeter mortar, the range of a 120 millimeter mortar, the range of a 75 millimeter recoilless rifle, 57 millimeter recoilless rifle, and the Russian 85 millimeter field guns that they had over in Cambodia and Russia. I mean, Cambodia and Laos. Those Russian field guns was a real bad guy. Mm -hmm. They were high velocity. Sound like a screaming banshee when it comes scared of the living bejesus out of you, you know, if you if you hear them coming in. And they, but they were high velocity weapon, and they didn't, apparently they didn't have uh, time fuses for that. The only one they had time fuses for was the 120 mortar. That was the one I was scared of more than the 85s, because it could penetrate 10 feet of overhead cover. You know, if you're down in a bunker, you could have 10 feet of logs and dirt. That 120 mortar would penetrate kill your ass anyway see so that's the one I dreaded more even though that water and sound is a lot worse and of course if you're out in the open it was bad too but it was any actually an anti the 85 was actually an anti-tank gun it wasn't made for for what they were using it for not that they didn't have other big heavier weapons they was just wasn't using them yet because they were going to use them when they went to the tanks they were going to bring their they were going to overrun us and bring those heavy guns up to attack the bigger towns, 
So they were keeping them in reserve. So they had these 85s in caves over in Cambodia and Laos. And inside these caves, they had these they constructed these big iron doors. So they'd open the doors, and they were expertly camouflaged. So they opened the doors, fired a few rounds, because they had zeroed these weapons in months before. So they, they had our, they knew right where we was at. And they'd just fire a few rounds, and then shut those doors, re-camouflage. You could send an aerial observer up there, and he couldn't find them. So your job, My job was is to, to identify the artillery, where it's coming from, and then, uh, then uh, do a mortar attack yeah, on their we artillery. We, artillerymen, a good artilleryman worth of salt can do what they call a crater analysis. And then just a few, a few minutes with that enemy shell crater, I can tell you exactly where that guy's at, it's pretty much. Only danger is, is running out there during an attack and throwing yourself on the ground next to them shell craters and getting that information <laughs> while they're still shelling you, mortars dropping all around you. Which, that's, that was, one, that was my, one of my primary jobs to do, so. And uh, when you uh, were awarded the Bronze Star, it was uh, that under was a mortar of, attack. Yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about that specific attack, or what happened? Well, uh, there was a tower. My, what I did is I set up an artillery observation post in a tower. The Special Forces had this tower. When I got in, by the time I got into the siege, the Special Forces wasn't using that tower. They were too busy trying to, trying to do a little patrolling out there to see where the enemy's at. And, and besides, that tower was deemed too dangerous. You know, so nobody wanted to be in that tower. You know, that's like standing up there and say, hey, here I am, you know. <laughs> and our, a good artilleryman never does that. He, he digs in on, on the forward slope of, you know, the military crest of a hill, which is the top of the hill. But when you come down that crest, of, on that military crest, that's the forward slope of the hill. And you dig in someplace there, you dig a hole and, and camouflage yourself. You don't want the, the enemy artillery to know where you're at. They'll, they'll counter battery fire against you and knock you out. So, or an airstrike or whatever. So you hide. In my case here, I am setting up a, my, my observation post right up there. It's the same as saying, hey, you guys, here I am. Come and get me. But you did it because you knew that you needed that information. Well, because yeah. I had a command of the train. Yeah. I had to, I could see where I need to see. Yeah. And it, this tower was pretty heavily sandbagged, so it was, they have to get a direct hit on you to really uh -huh. knock you out. Of course, everybody, everyone up there with me got wounded, <laughs> you know, <laughs> shrapnel wounds and so forth. But that, that's because we had a trap door, even though the trap door was sandbagged, so you had. But we had a makeshift uh, counterbalance system to help lift the sandbagged door up and crawl up in there. And right in the middle of that, in a 55-gallon drum, we had a 50-caliber machine gun. So there was. It was pretty crowded in that tower, but it was a, anyway, so, so I, I was up in that tower, and, uh, and uh, my battalion commander got wounded. He just took off his helmet for a second to scratch his head, I guess, and the big pieces, one of those 82 millimeter mortars hit right underneath the tower. And some of that shrapnel come flying up in there and zonked him in the head. And it's kind of stunned him. Of course, uh, and Lou, Lou's sitting over here. He knows what a shrapnel will do. They look a lot, lot of times look a lot worse than they are. But that man, it looked like he, he had a gaping hole in his head. So, and he's my commanding officer, you know. So I grabbed him and, and started giving him some first aid, and just patched, putting a compress on the moon to make sure he wasn't bleeding and got him out of that tower. I helped him get out of the tower, which would be later cited in my, in my award. And then I went back to work in the tower, and it wasn't until the next day that, uh, that uh, we, we were getting, uh, getting shelled real bad and so forth. A mortar was, uh, was uh, the, <coughs> The North Vietnamese Army had a mortar in real close in, an 82 mortar, knocking the hell out of our guys. So I had to go out there and make a crater analysis during that mortar attack. And my, my data that I sent to the guns, they fired and got secondary explosions, and that was into that mortar. So, so I knocked out that mortar, basically, with my, with my crater analysis. So that's what I got the, the word for.
But basically, your job was after a mortar fell, you had to go to the crater yeah. where they're obviously they're aim, aiming for anyway in that area, yeah. and then make an analysis. Well, what uh, you do is you take a during a during an attack. So there's several steps. Yeah. You you get a any artillery weapon, including a mortar, comes in with an, at an angle. Now the mortar is a high angle. It comes in you know real, and it's a little harder to read than than the regular traditional artillery with a little flatter trajectory. It comes at a at a, at a angle like so when the, what you do is you get your, your spatial artillery compass not only can you get direction but you can also get elevations so you can tell what angle that 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 shell came in at and by telling you that you immediately know whether it's a mortar or a gun or a, a recoilless rifle so you know it gives you a lot of information and you shoot a back direction as to which way that came from and the way I would do that is I'd split that crater with a, I carried a piece of parachute cord on a couple little tent pegs with me, stretch that across the crater, the axis of the crater, and you reach down in there and you find this fuse tunnel, because every artillery round has a fuse on it, on the nose of it. And when that shell goes off, that fuse continues to go and makes its own little tunnel. And that, you use that axis of that fuse tunnel, and I'd carry a, an ammo rod from a, from a 105 artillery shell with me, and I just lay that in there, set my compass on, and I, and you know, this, this line I could get a very accurate shot as to what direction, back direction. And now this all sounds like a real complicated, but you get, I was very proficient in what I did, so I could tell you very soon how far away he was, what size of gun he was, or motor or, or gun or whatever it was, and then I could send that information to, to our, our own artillery, and they could fire, or. Or I could give the location to an aircraft if, it was a, if I had an aircraft, and they could call an airstrike. See, you could work back and forth. So anyway, so I destroyed a, a lot. I destroyed some field guns. I destroyed some, you know, d doing this process. That wasn't the only time I did that, but that particular time, I got written up for a, for an award. Now, during the siege, uh, how long did the siege last, and how much sleep did you get during that time? Well, the siege started long before I went in there because it was 56 days. Now, when I call it a siege, basically, if you use the terminology siege in the true sense, it probably we probably never really had a, a true, true siege, even even Dien Bien Phu would, you know. But here's the thing: a siege starts with the day that you go. Uh, uh, 20, 24 hours, and uh, another 24 hours, and another, you know, days on end without any, any break. You get enemy, enemy guns are firing into your position without, without, a, without a 24, without any day, a full day's break. Then it becomes a siege, the way we calculate it. But when I went in there, I got in there the first part of June. The enemy had had been had under siege since the 5th of May. So the, siege, the official day of the siege started was the 5th of May. I didn't come in until till, till the beginning of the next month. So that's when, but that's when the siege tightened. That's when the enemy, because the city of Dokto was part of the, the original siege, because they was firing on it, you know, as, as well as Ben Head. It was all artillery fire to begin with. But then when the enemy came in and, and surrounded Ben Hinton, come in real tight on our perimeter, the last three weeks, that's my period. And they were dug in right in my perimeter defense for three weeks. And during that time, you Multi got regiments. very little sleep. So I think you yeah. said there were two days you didn't get any sleep yeah, at all, right? Yeah, right. How do you keep going during something like that? Is it just... Uh, no well, adrenaline? adrenaline's a funny thing, you know. It, it kicks in. And, you have days when you, you think, I can't continue to go on. Then all of a sudden, something kicks in, and you just get a new shot in your arm. Lou can probably attest to that. You, you, it's, like, it's almost like you had a, an adrenaline shot or something, you know. And you, you, all of a sudden, you, you're back to life. No matter, even though you're, you haven't maybe slept in, the, one, the longest I went was 48 hours during that siege, with no sleep at all. But I was alert. Very alert, so alert that, that I was probably more alert than, than anybody in this room right now.
even though I was deprived of sleep, because the brain is, had done some strange things when it's under under duress. Well, when you when it's life and death, yeah, yeah it can focus. I'm sure. So but, that's that's why I can describe that. And even when you did get sleep, how much sleep did you get? Very, you know. I had reports that had to be in the higher headquarters. You know, you can't go without reports. Right. <laughs> you gotta have, you gotta make your reports. So I had these uh, situation reports that had to go to all the way to the train because we had communication, radio communication with with a with our first field forces headquarters back in the train on the coast. So so even the, even after I'd been out there all day doing my thing in the daytime, I set up at night doing my reports, and I couldn't go go effectively go to try to get any rest until my last report went in around midnight or so. And then normally you know, daylight in the central highlands came around, around 5 o'clock in the morning, so four, between 4 and 5 o'clock in the morning. So you only had, even if you had a, a full night's sleep after your work, what I considered a full, full night would be the maximum of four hours. And a lot of times because extra workload or something, I'd be lucky to get two hours. And of course, I didn't have no trouble falling asleep. Once you're out. You know, <laughs> I was just out. Yeah. But, but you had somebody scheduled to wake you up at certain, you know, certain times. And you slept in your clothes, yeah. and you never had a chance to shower. Did you shave during that time? or? Nope. I didn't. During that, there was a six-week period that I had no shower, no shave. So everybody was looking. And hardly pretty, a chance to brush my teeth. Uh -huh. So everybody's looking pretty grizzled, I imagine. Yeah. Everybody's just on, and the on smells the in those bunkers got pretty rank. Oh yeah, yeah. Because you're living in the bunkers. Uh -huh. That's your, that's your primary. Now in my case, I went in there because of my rank. The officers automatically, like my battalion commander, he, they provided him a small bunker room with a with a place to sleep you know, for him, just his own private space. The S3, which was a major, he got the same privileges. I was the S2, but I was starting first class. My place, is, they gave me this room to put my maps and everything. I had a place about 18 inches wide and about six feet long. Just enough that to was lie my, down. That was my space. <laughs> so I had a folding cot. So when I sue, first off, I only had a, I went in there, I didn't even have a folding cot. I had a, a stretcher, one of those little old stretchers, mm -hmm. canvas stretchers. I was going to use that for a bunk, but I lucked out. The guy was rotating out of there, gave me his cot, a little folding canvas cot. So I could set that up, and I just barely had enough room to, to get the legs open. And that, So I basically slept where I worked. Mm -hmm. However, I spent a lot of time out in that tower and stuff, so I, I wasn't stuck there all the time. But when I, when I wasn't in the tower, I was down in this room, because that's where I had my big battle map showing, keeping track of where all the enemy was with those circles on it. Mm -hmm. So, Wasn't a lot of room, though. Wasn't no, no room. No. Very, very tight court. Now, uh, can you explain the title of your book, The Phantom of Ben Het? I know, the, I know the story behind it, but for the tape, if you could tell why you, tell us why you named the, the book that. <clears throat> Is, and I reveal at the end of the book as a phantom of Ben Het myself. Right. I'm the Phantom of Ben Head. And the reason I use that term is because nobody really knew I was there and what, how important my job was. Even afterwards, people, people didn't realize, as I, as I developed in my book, <coughs> the only way we got out of there was due to one, one action I took. Because you called in the airstrikes. Yeah. You... you uh, you controlled all the mortar attacks and artillery, so. Yeah. So basically, I called in a strike that normally wouldn't even be approved because it was too close. A chance of wiping us a bunch of us out. Do you want to tell that story about the airstrike you called in? Was it B-52s? Yes. Or? What I found out, <coughs> we captured. Well, actually, we didn't capture him. He, he gave himself up. He was a turncoat. A North Vietnamese soldier came in, and he was really a very full of fear, shaking real bad. <clears throat> Don't forget, we'd been 
We've been fighting these guys pretty bad. We've get, been dumping some bad stuff on them, a lot of airstrikes. And he, he knew that they were getting ready to, to try to overrun us. So he knew it was going to really turn bad. It was going to be some real bad combat. It was all or nothing type thing. They were, they were going to overrun us. So he knew some, uh, and most likely a, a bunch of them were going to die. He knew that. And so he knew that, that taking, this, taking this main hill was going to be a, a tough situation. Not only because we had a lot of firepower, but it's just, you know. So anyway, he came in there and he basically told my interpreter, through, through my interpreter, I talked to him through my interpreter, told me where his headquarters was located and it was a regimental headquarters, 28th Regiment. Those guys were the same ones that fought the Marines at Quezon a year before. So, so this guy's telling me that, hey, we're out here in numbers, and we're, we're, about, we're getting ready to overrun you, but we're going to try to overrun you, and most likely, but we know a bunch of us going to die, and I don't want to die, basically. He was just fearful of dying, so he's a turncoat, basically. But well, the way I question him, when you, when you, the best time when you're in intelligence, the very best information you get is if, if you get an enemy that's been wounded and he's, he's in shock, the very first thing he says is pretty, pretty correct. But as soon as he gets a chance to think about it, he starts lying. And then the information starts getting more, no, not, not reliable. But I consider this guy's information pretty reliable because of certain questions I was able to ask him. And basically he told me that where his headquarters was at, it was right out there at the end of that airstrip, right outside our perimeter. They were dug in there. and. They was getting ready to overrun us. That he basically what he told me is the night of the of the twenty first, twenty second that night, which I put in my book. They planned on overrunning us that night, which the only thing that stopped them was because I'd spent several hours with a fire plan that, that during the day before that night. And when the night night came, I had so much artillery in there. That, they, they had no, I didn't give them no place to muster their troops. So that, so they called off the, 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 the final attack that night, but they were getting ready. As soon as they got all their stuff together again, they were going to do it. They were just waiting for the right moment to overrun us. And so when he told me that, that, this, that they were getting ready to do this and where his headquarters at, I called a, a Air Force Air, Air Liaison Officer in Doc Toe, and together we planned an airstrike against that enemy headquarters. I pretty much pinpointed their headquarters. And we couldn't bring a full B-52 arc light in, which was three B-52s coming in at 30,000 feet. Couldn't do that. It was too dangerous. So between me and the ALO, we got our heads together and decided that I could safely, fairly safely, bring in one B-52 at a, a lower altitude. We took 10,000 feet off the altitudes, brought them in 20,000 feet. That, in turn, by coming in lower, the cone of fire was, is reduced, you know, and more accurate. So basically, that's what we decided on. Bring one B-52 bomber in and hit that target. The only thing is, uh, as I point out in my book, they forgot about the leaflet bomb. The leaflet bombs, whenever our B-52 strikes, we use a leaflet bombs to tell the enemy you know, to, how to go about giving up and all that stuff, how to be a turncoat and all that. Anyway, this leaflet bomb still has the same, pretty much the same ballistics as a regular bomb, weight-wise and everything. You figure it's got about 750-pound bombs, got probably at least 600 pounds of it as leaflets. That's a lot of leaflets. <laughs> So, but because of coming in at this lower altitude, they didn't get the word to, to change the fusing on that leaflet bomb. So it just came down as a missile with no explosive, but it knocked out the South Vietnamese Army Tactical Operations Center, <laughs> which is about 50 feet from my position. So, so how close was the strike from where you guys were? It was pretty close. About right? 500 meters is the main strike. That enemy headquarters was about 500 meters from my position. Normally, the Air Force, the Air Force is, uh, 
standard operation procedure did not allow you to bring anything in closer than two kilometers, which is 2,000 meters, and preferably keep it at three, three kilometers. Mm -hmm. Two to three kilometers is the maximum closeness that you can come in. But you needed that accuracy. I needed much closer. Yeah, or they were going to overrun you that yeah. night or the yeah. next morning. So it may have, it probably did prevent the attack, right? Right. So it, well, because I didn't find out, I didn't find out that. You know, I just know that, that we didn't get overrun. Right. And, and then all of a sudden, after a couple of days, we started finding out the enemy was withdrawing. Actually, they started withdrawing immediately, but I mean, I didn't know. I had no way of finding this out. But the airplane, the Air Force pilots started seeing open gun positions. The enemy just left their guns and all. They never done that. You know, that was not like the North Vietnamese Army never left their weapons. You know, but they they left gun positions. They just uncovered them and dug out, took off. You know. How fierce is an accurate B-52 bombing run? I mean, if you're in there as the enemy, what's that like? It's got to be. Oh yes. Everything's devastated. Now right? this particular plane only had 750-pound bombs on it, uh -huh. but you figure there's about a load of on one B-52 carried around 68 of those, 68 750-pound bombs going off on one one little cluster. It's I mean, a hell of a bang. You're not going to survive. <laughs> so, so basically. What they did is, uh, I found out later through my, my research for my book, the enemy out of that regiment only got back to Cambodia out of a regiment with 200 troops. And how many in a regiment? 2,000? Well, no, I, uh, I said... Uh, 10,000, right? I said uh, there's 10,000 men to a, to a division, which which is normally three regiments, but time you strip out the, uh -huh. the, the artillery and so forth. A, re, a regiment, we always figured it was a regiment, at, at least around 2,500 men. I mean, the standard regiment is 2,500 men. So there's two of them dug in on our perimeter, which means that there was 5,000 of them right there, right out there on that, right out there on that side of the runway, because you had the 66 regiment, 28. However. The way, uh, the way the war was told in the history books, they reduced, they reduced these regiments to, to suit the, you know, the, the people that's writing. The history, uh, yeah. They reduced it to suit their, they said that we were uh, the official version that we, that they, they were saying in the newspaper, the enemy made, the enemy strength was anywhere from 1,000 to 3,000. Right. And that was totally, totally wrong, you know. So the airstrikes and the artillery uh, uh, mortar attacks that you guys sent over maybe destroyed 80 to 90 percent of the, the troop strength, do you think? Of but the, 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 official, the official count, like I said, the way they deflated the count, the official count was that, that we probably killed 800 of them in that strike. They said that that regiment was only a thousand man regiment. I know better, but you know, I I don't have an official count. I have to go by what the what the, the official count is. But even even so, even if I only killed 800 and saved the camp, because they immediately started they immediately re started their withdrawal. There's nobody left to to put the attack together after yeah. that. Because yeah. they the 28th Regiment yeah. who took part of the Quezon, they were the brains of the whole operation. Uh -huh. That 28th Regiment. They were the ones charged with conducting this siege. So once I knocked out their headquarters, you know. Now this the, the, was the press arriving at this time, or this was after the B-52 strike was. The press started arriving. Our first press didn't come about until the around the 20, 20 21st of, of June. Was that after the B-52 strike or before? No, just before. Just before. The, uh -huh. the B-52 strike took place on the night of. 25, 26 June, or 20, 24, 25 June, rather. Well, I was just thinking, and, and we were talking a little bit about the press. I mean, it must have been a real circus atmosphere yeah. after a while. You're under siege, and all of a sudden the press come. Yeah. You've got these different cultures. You've got the Americans, the Montagnards, who have special diet requirements. Yeah. And then you've got the South Vietnamese right. Army there. Yeah, it's a circus. Uh, you're, yeah, you're, you're tell me about when, when the, all of a sudden it became news in the United States that this uh, tiny little uh, uh, fire base was under siege. 
what happened at that point? What, what, how did you accommodate the press? And I mean, it must have been strange to have... The only way the press could get in there mostly was by chopper. Uh -huh. but anyway, uh, you had these high, high profile press like Peter Arnett, who was a, our man in Baghdad during, during the first Gulf, Persian Gulf War. Mm -hmm. Well, you had him, and he was already a Pulitzer Prize winner. You know, so he was, he came in there, but he came in the North Hill, which where we had our 105 battery, jumped off the chopper, talked to the battery commander a few minutes, talked to a couple RTOs, and caught the next chopper out. Went back and wrote the story about the Ben Head. Wrote several stories. Matter of fact, I understand he even wrote a book about it. <laughs> he didn't, didn't have much time to gather information, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Tell us a little bit about the Mountain Yard troops and, and the story about, of course, everything was, at one point, the helicopters wouldn't even land and they, it was, everything was parachuted in, the supplies, right? So the, the one little story in my book that I really like, my favorite, is that the Mountain Yarders wouldn't eat. They wouldn't eat uh, the rations. We had what we call a, we, we had some uh, special rations that, that we came up with, rice, dried fish and veggies and all that, but it was all dried. And, and they didn't like these rations, and they wouldn't eat them. They wanted fresh meat. And their tradition is fresh pigs, fresh water buffalo. That's the kind of meat. They, they kill it with a ritual, you know. They have a little a religious ritual when they kill. Well, pigs, for whatever reason, they do not survive an airdrop. I mean, I don't know if it has something to do with their makeup, shit, the shock, they'll die. And then, of course, if it's dead, they won't, they won't eat it. They, gotta have, they have to kill it with this religious ritual. So the only animal that really survives an airdrop, good is a water buffalo, but it takes a, a hell of a big crate to put a water buffalo in, because a water buffalo is a pretty good-sized animal, too. And so to save the weight, to, to, to solve some of this weight problem, the Air Force came up with a harness attached straight to the buffalo, a parachute, so the, the, the old water buffalo come down with just a parachute, like a trooper, you know. <laughs> he hits on all fours, and he's pretty excited when he hits the ground, and it's kind of hard to, to get that parachute off of him. And the mountain yards love those American parachutes, all that, because we, we not only had camouflage suits, but we also had some white silk and red silk, blue silk suits, because we, we had such a demand for shoots that they couldn't, they didn't have enough camouflage ones, so they had to use whatever they had. The mountain yards love that silk material, because that's what they wear, silk over there. They'd grab those parachutes, and after a while you wouldn't have no parachutes, so <laughs> the Air Force would get real angry about losing all these shoots. So the orders came down, you keep losing shoots, we're not going to give you no more supplies. So that comes to my story about the water buffalo. Here comes the water buffalo, hanging from a parachute, and a, my orders are basically, don't lose no more shoots. So I have to be out there on the ground waiting for that guy to hit. And then I got to take my, I had a hunting knife, and I had to run him down and cut that parachute off of him before, and rescue those parachutes before the mountain yards get it. And then I give the mountain yards their, their fresh meat. And you're in the middle of a combat zone to begin with. <laughs> That's what this is going and on. And of course, <laughs> every time we had an airdrop, the enemy artillery opened up. So you're out there dodging, dodging the enemy artillery rounds. So that's. I mean, it's got to be surreal. Here you are. You've got a water buffalo coming out of the sky like a trooper, and uh, you're getting a mortar attack, and you're trying to save the parachute. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, so, your life is in peril. <laughs> so I don't really have to explain much more, do I? I mean, it, it must have been a bizarre situation. You get the yeah. Now, one of the other things that the mountain yards had to have is pumpkin. They ate a lot of pumpkin. Uh -huh and stuff like that. I can't remember what all we fed them, but, but the big thing was this meat, fresh meat. They had to, they had to kill this buffalo with a, under, they have a certain religious ritual that they kill it. So, so like I said, you gotta give it to them on the hoof. You can't give it to them dead or they won't eat it. You yeah. just waste it all your time. And you're still trying to conduct yeah. a war, yeah. you know, <laughs> but, but uh, making sure everybody's happy. But those mountain yeah. are just like the primitive yeah. Indians we read about, yeah. they're very primitive. You know. um, yeah, another interesting story is the mascot called the whore, and uh, I don't know if you mind telling the story. I know you, you, you said you mentioned you had a sixth sense, and you can tell 
when a mortar attack was coming in, yeah. but uh, the dog had, had it, could hear it before it happened too, right? Yeah. When I went in there, they had GIs had you know they had they have a they had their own vocabulary. You know how GIs have. Right. They had this dog, and of course the newspapers even had a story about, it, but they changed the name of it. Couldn't they couldn't put the name? They they call it war in the newspaper, <laughs> but the special forces' the actual name was Whore. That's what they named her, and she was a little old yellow mongrel dog, but she could hear that incoming. She could hear those guns, those Russian field guns, and so that pop, and so forth. And she could, the mortar, uh, the mortars are different. You, it's very difficult to hear a mortar go off because it's a thunk. You know, it goes, all they do is drop it down this tube. And when it hits, it's on its way, you know. But most of the time, it's very difficult to, not, a lot of times you don't hear mortars at all until they hit. And then, and then it's too late because if, it if it didn't kill you, you know, if it missed you, no sweat anyway. But, but anyway, this dog could hear a lot of this. And once that dog jumped, you better jump. If something, if something come from someplace, you better take cover. So, first few days, I, I watched horror. You know, I'm, and when she jumped, I jumped, took cover. But in a few days, I was beating her to the punch. You know. <laughs> well, was it just your hearing, or? Yeah, I, I got sensitive. Uh -huh. You know, I, I can't explain it. I just knew that it was incoming coming in. Now the the Russian field guns over in Cambodia and Laos, I could actually hear that little pop. Just a little faint, poof. and I knew there's a round on the way, and I had only several seconds to take cover. So, that, but I developed a sixth sense, like I said, and very important to my own life to have this sense. A lot of people got got wounded because they couldn't, didn't know incoming. But every time, like when my commanding officer got wounded, I was already, I was already ducked, mm -hmm. and everybody, everybody in the tower that particular day got wounded from that same round that wounded my commander, except me. But you were there for a year, yeah. right? And then you went back to, uh, back home. Fort, Fort Carson, Colorado. And that appealed to me, I like. That sounded real nice, Fort Carson. Had you been out to Colorado before then, or is this the first? No, that's the first time I, I've been, actually been to Colorado. So anyway, so I called my wife and I said, we had a house down in Lawton, Oklahoma. I said, have you got any bites on the house yet? She said, yes, I have a buyer if you want to sell it. I said, sell it. We're going to Fort Carson. So I made a decision. I, I didn't make that decision until I got to, to Seattle, Washington. And I called her from Seattle, Washington. And what year was that? That was in 69. 69? Yeah. Well, do you want to talk about your family? And we can, we can end here pretty sure. soon. But talk about your wife, Mavis, and all your kids. How many kids do you have? Four daughters? And yeah. Yeah, we, we got married uh, over there in England, England in 1959. My brother was stationed in the Air Force. He, my brother, Jim, was Air Force, and he was, he's deceased. He died in, in, <coughs> in 85, 1985. And he died of uh, cancer. So... Anyway, I met Mavis through, over there in England when they were stationed at Lake and East Air Base. And so we got married. At the time we got our paperwork all squared away, we got married on the St. Valentine's Day, 1959. <coughs> and so our first daughter came along about, I didn't waste any time. We was married about 10 months or so. <laughs> when our first daughter came. Well, anything else? Anything I forget that you guys wanted to ask, Sherry or, or Mavis? Anything you wanted I to ask? I just want to add that all four of my daughters have seen some military service. Sherry, I'm sitting here, she was at the Naval Academy. Even though she didn't think that was for her, she only stayed about eight months. But, but she went, she, she had the privilege of going to the Naval right. Academy. It was very difficult and, to get in, yeah. And she turned around and came back here and finished her education at UCCS. So she, it didn't stop her from getting her uh -huh. college degree. So we're proud of her. My daughter, Julie, the one that's in the, that was in the Persian Gulf War, she was in the Marine Corps. She had to take five years in order to get the job she wanted, but she was a, she was a, a, a munitions specialist. 
she's the one that packed the ammunition on the Huey Cobras. Mm -hmm. And women don't normally get that job. Right. There again, the only thing I want to say is there's still a lot of uh, prejudice against women in the military. And she ran into that pretty heavy. Uh -huh. but, she, but anyway, that's what she did in the Marine Corps, was loading those Huey Cobras. And so, the reason I even mention that, when she got to Persian Gulf War, the commanding officer didn't want no women in his outfit, so he transferred her out. And because it wasn't a very long war, when it was over, his outfit went back to States. And she, I mean, her outfit went back to States. But as soon as the war was over, they shipped her back to that guy that wouldn't have her during the war. See. <laughs> so, but it's, anyway, so that's where she was at. And then our old, uh, second daughter, Tina, she spent a hitch in the Army. And she spent some time over in Korea. Mm -hmm. And she got sick and had to get a medical discharge. But she spent a couple of years in the Army. And then our oldest daughter, Donna, she was in the Naval Reserve for, for a while. Mm -hmm. So they've all seen a little bit of military. And I believe that women have a, do have a place in the military. And there's a lot of people who don't believe that. So I just have to You be, better say that. You've got four daughters, right? Well, I do believe I, I do <laughs> But believe, you do believe it, yeah. <laughs> there's certain jobs that, that it's hard on a woman to do, but there's certain jobs that are they're just as good as any damn man. And I'll say, tell that to oh, anybody. Oh, yeah. Well, I can. I can uh... yeah. They make good pilots, uh -huh. for example. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. nothing wrong. So, so I, have, I, I have a woman boss. <laughs> I'm not so, going to say different. So anyway, I'll, I'll, I still will back up. You know, anybody tells me that women, there's no place for women in armed forces. Uh -huh. They don't have no friend in me. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs>